A very good afternoon. Respected resource person for this session. Dr. Arnath sir. And dear participants. Today. We have a very eminent personality. Dr. Arnath sir from National Institute of Technology Warangal. To deliver a talk on photoluminescence spectroscopy. In this AICT training and learning Atal Academy sponsored one week online faculty development program on photonics organized by Department of Physics, Electronics and Photonics, Rajarshi Shahu Mahavdala Latu. I welcome you all for this session and request my departmental colleague, Mr. Sapni Lundalkar, to introduce today's resource person, Dr. D. Harnath sir. Sapnil, please. Thank you, sir. If uh, something is uh, scattered with a lot of small things, they are spread all over it. Good noon to all. It gives me great pleasure to introduce a resource person of this session. On the behalf of Rajesh Shahuma Vidalalatur, sir, I welcome you for this one week online faculty development program on photonics. Sir, you hardly need any introduction. You have made all of us proud by your distinguished work in numerous capacities. A man of distinct vision and a fountainhead of illuminating ideas and idol of knowledge, experience and inspiration, Dr. Harnath sir. Dr. Harnath sir is currently working as an associate professor in physics at the National Institute of Technology, Varanga, India. Earlier to that, he served as a principal scientist at CSIR National Physical Laboratory, New Delhi for 20 years. He is a recipient of many awards and honors in physical science, including NPL's Young Scientist Award in 2003, CSIR Young Scientist Award in 2004, DST's Boys Cast Fellow Award in Physical Sciences in 2006, Vera Distinguished Scientist of the Year 2016, Fellow of Luminescence Society of India 2017, Academic Audit Member of VNIT Nagpur 2017, Transfer of a Technology Award 2018, Fellow of Luminescence Society of India 2018, Visiting Scientist for Nanotheronautics, United States of America 2019, to 2024, Grassroot Innovators, Virtual Mela Award 2020, etc. Recently, with the support of uh, Professor D. Denakar, HOD Physics, National Institute of Technology, Varangal, he has developed a unique virus disinfectant system called All in One Ozonet, which can kill all types of viruses without involvement of hazardous chemicals within few minutes. This was well appreciated by Ministry of Electronics and IT Government of India. His postdoctoral experience gained at Nanocrystal Technology, New York, United States of America for many years and thereafter visits as visiting scientists had enriched him for the synthesis and characterization of binary and ternary nanophosphors for white light emitting diode applications. While at CSR NPL, he actively laid the alternative of energy materials group with an aim of developing novel nanophosphorus system and devices for various strategies applications. He had licensed a yellow green emitting Afterglow phosphor material in September 2016 to an Indian paint industry called MS Cutland Infra Products Private Limited, Nagpur for RS 11.50 lakhs. Before to that, he and his team of scientists had the credit of transferring two more technologies to Defense Laboratory Jodhpur DRDO and one technology of AC driven electroluminescent panels to ISRO. His other research and development 
treatment interest are positioned in the synthesis and characterization of nano phase luminescent materials for leds and spectral energy conversion in silicon solar cells fabrication of luminescent electroluminescent panels for back lighting of lcd panels development of primary colors red green and blue emitting long persistent phosphors for dark vision display applications development of radio luminescent screens for high energy up to 80 million electron hold x ray real time imaging and biomedical applications of nano phosphorus as well he yeah. has a vast research experience of 26 years and supervised six phd two mphil and 25 mtech thesis dear participant i wish to highlight that he has six granted patents three field patents and 13 chapters in books more than 180 research papers in science citation index journals of repute 25 virtual journal papers more than 200 national and international conference papers three journal articles two technical reports to his credit many of his research papers were cited by nature appreciated by nanotech web verticalnews.com highlyweb.com etc he is also an editorial board member for international journal of luminescence and applications and reviewer to many international journals like rsc aps aip willi iop springers elsewhere sciences his research credentials as reported by google scholar are h index 37 it index 100 citations 4523 he has handled more than 3 crores worth of sponsored research projects sponsored by serb dst dae brns drdo csr and mhrd with the support of his colleague he and dr abul azim together defended before the committee and successful in bringing dst fist project worth rupees 2075 crores to the physics department nit warangal for the procurement of xrd fsm machines i welcome you to this uh, session sir over to you yadav sir please sir uh good morning are you can share sir now okay sir good morning everyone thank you yadav ji thank you sapnil ji for giving me uh, a great introduction so let me share my screen could you able to see my screen sir yadav ji is my screen yes. visible yes sir yes sir yes sir yes sir okay. perfect okay right yes, thank sir. you very much okay sir thank you so uh, good morning everyone uh, i am uh, dr d harna currently working as associate professor in the department of physics nit warangal so uh, my most of the research work is concentrated uh, in the photoluminescence spectroscopy so this is the topic uh, i have chosen and this is my email and this is my research papers where you can see the, the type of uh, research uh, we are doing and this is my host institute nit warangal and this is the institute website this is our department's website and below one is my profile and my research interests so you can go to this website and uh, you can see the research activities at nit warangal and uh, here at nit warangal i have a very small group uh, earlier to that i worked in uh, csr npl there i was heading about 18 scientists 
and 25 research students uh, under my group. But uh, now I have moved to NIT Varangal in 2018. Slowly I am building my own group here, which is called Luminescent Materials and Devices Group. Uh, currently I have three PhD students. Uh, Naina is still working in NPL. Uh, so and under the joint supervision of uh, Dr. Silesh. So she she is about to complete her uh, PhD. And uh, Mr. Seju Misra is currently working with me as JRF and Ms. Rakshita also uh, as a JRF, CS as JRF. She is working with me. And I have got three more uh, postdocs uh, in my group. Uh, Dr. Chandra Rao, Dr. Vishnu Jaiswal, and uh, Dr. Jayanti. And she is the woman scientist recently joined with me. So this is my small group. So all the uh, research credentials goes to my past students and my present students. It's I'm just uh, representing them, their work. So today's topic is photoluminescence spectroscopy. Let me touch upon a little bit of theory, measurement techniques, and uh, some applications, some unusual applications I would like to show you so that uh, you, you may be triggered to do research in this uh, very beautiful field of spectroscopy. So uh, the first of the thing is, uh, before going into the spectroscopic aspects or photoluminescence aspects, uh, we should understand about electromagnetic radiation. You know that electromagnetic radiation uh, uh, consists of uh, packets of energies which are called photons and you know that the electric and magnetic fields will be perpendicular to each other and they will be oscillating and uh, during the propagation of radiation. And if you see the electromagnetic spectrum, it ranges from shorter wavelength to lo longer wavelength. The shorter, shortest of all wavelengths is uh, gamma rays. Okay. Very short wavelength. <clears throat> and then X-rays. And then a small portion is our uh, ultraviolet and visible. Visible, you know that uh, violet to red, WIPGR. So this is a very small region and infrared microwave and radio waves. So this is about increasing uh, wavelength and this is with respect to increasing frequency. So now we are concentrating a bit of ultraviolet. Maybe you can say that only visible spectrum, which is a very small segment of electromagnetic spectrum, which we are going to study. Again, in this uh, ultraviolet, because earlier photoluminescence spectroscopy means it is the only visible light. The emission, uh, if the material emits the visible light, so within from violet to red, then it is considered as photoluminescence. But nowadays, a bit of ultraviolet is also taken into consideration. So uh, you can see that the same, uh, this portion is uh, enlarged here. So you have ultraviolet spectrum and visible spectrum. Visible start from 400 to 700 nanometers, whereas below 400 nanometers is ultraviolet. So you have ultraviolet A, ultraviolet B, and, and then ultraviolet C, and below 100 nanometers, uh, be, below 200 nanometers, you can also call it as uh, vacuum ultraviolet. You can call it as vacuum ultraviolet. Uh, so here it, it was not mentioned, but uh, the thing is, uh, like uh, you might have observed that if somebody goes into hot sun, so they say that uh, your skin is burning or you tanning, tanning of uh, skin. Uh, it becomes little dark, darkish, like southern part of India or Sri Lankans. You see that they are more towards the equator and more sunlight is there. So they are uh, having little uh, less complexion. I mean, the complexion, dark complexion is more. So that is because of this sunburn or aging effect due to ultraviolet radiation, which is there in the sunlight. So that's why uh, eventually if you are too much exposed to ultraviolet radiations, there could be some DNA damages or cell damages that may occur. So that's why whenever you are going out, you are asked to apply sunscreen lotions. A lot of uh, lotions are available in the market. So you need to uh, put those lotions 
may, may be to the face or hands and legs which is being exposed to sunlight so that is not that uh, they will uh, stop tanning but the main purpose of applying those creams like fair and lovely now it is called uh, glow and lovely and some sunscreen lotions actually the, it has got uh, uh, zinc oxide or uh, pio2 based uh, uh, paste okay so zinc oxide or tio2 both have a similar uh, <coughs> band gap so the band gap lies exactly in this region uva region okay around uh, 390 370 to 390 nanometers so the bulk band gap so if the band gap is there that means uh, this radiation can be easily absorbed so the cream if it has zinc oxide or tio2 so that will absorb that radiation effectively and uh, that will emit in the blue region somewhat blue re bluish region that is actually photoluminescence property which we are seeing so that's why whenever you are going out if you apply the, those creams then uh, instead of uh, directly ultraviolet damaging your skin so it will be absorbed by the paste you apply on your face that cream whatever you apply on your face so that will absorb and once you come home and wash your uh, face, uh, then everything will be washed away and you may feel that you, you are a little bit uh, uh, fairer than earlier. But nothing, only thing is there are the radiation effects of sun is being uh, not there. That's why whatever color you have, that is retained. You never become uh, fairer. Okay. All this, uh, these are publicity stunts. So don't believe that. Whatever complexion you have, that will be retained. You will not become more and more dark. So when you apply those creams, that's that's why when you are going out, you better apply certain sunscreen lotions. Okay, so that will block both UVA and UVB. And you may be uh, like some of the TV advertisements you might have seen that uh, earlier in good olden days, surfer advertisement was there. So if you say that. Uh, 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 Uski sadi, meri sadi se safed kaise or something. Some advertisement was there. So some two women they cross each other, uh, and the uh, the other lady will be wearing a brighter white uh, cloth sadi, uh, whereas this one will be amazing to see. The, this lady uh, uh, thinks that how how come that sadi is uh, more brighter than mine. So actually the that's the advertisement of surf. Surf, uh, essentially, they use a chemical called tinopol. It's a UV sensitive uh, material. They mix it, mix it up with uh, this one. Nowadays, everybody is using even uh, this uh, RIN, RIN and uh, Tide and other people also, they are mixing. So that is a photosensitive uh, flor organic fluorescent material. So what it does, that also absorbs the ultraviolet radiation that is present in the sun and it converts into blue light. That's why uh, whenever you purchase the whenever you wash uh, your cloth with uh, such type of powder, see this tinopol will get into the fiber and it will stick to the cloth fiber. It's not it's not a hazardous chemical. It's a very mild chemical. So that will attach to the fiber of your uh, cloth so when that is uh, cloth is uh, put under sun so then you will see that it is looking very bright it is emitting light whereas uh, the same cloth if you bring it to the shade uh, so you don't see that, that that much brightness that is just because of effect of tinopor not that uh, the cleaning is too much done for the cloth or something okay so these are the business tactics they use and UVC is, uh, you don't get it in the sun's atmosphere. Uh, I mean, in the Earth's atmosphere, the ozone layer, which is there on the top, uh, in the above the atmosphere, that will uh, absorb the radiations. But uh, if somebody, like uh, in spacecraft, if they are going above, so then uh, they, they are, there are chances this astronauts and other thing, they may be exposed to UVC radiation, which are still dangerous. As the number goes, like UVU, UVA is little dangerous. Uh, UVB, it is 
more but dangerous and uvc is still more and vacuum ultraviolet ultraviolet uv is still dangerous okay but vacuum ultraviolet and uvc are being absorbed by ozone layer so we don't have much problem with this so coming back to the visible spectrum which starts from 400 to 700 nanometers so this spectrum is very much useful for our uh, uh, i mean the living organisms plants and every, everything because you see there is a uh, uh, there is a standard called ppix ppix is proto porphyrin 9 <clears throat> it's not ix pp pp9 so this is an organic compound it is uh, which which uh, which basically stimulates and uh, for the development of hemoglobin in humans and chlorophyll in plants okay, photosynthesis and other things they takes place with the visible light itself so this is much more uh, useful for our uh, planet earth for plants for human beings for all animals and so on so this is one of the chemical we can use it as a standard and we can estimate uh, how better we are getting these radiations on earth so this is about uh, light okay so there are many spectroscopic techniques like gamma ray emission spectroscopy x-ray absorption emission fluorescence and diffraction spectroscopy vacuum ultraviolet absorption so many raman scattering microwave absorption spr okay nmr so there are many spectroscopic techniques and their range of wavelengths are different and their applications are also very very different so out of which we are going to talk about uh, photoluminescence spectroscopy. So, so kindly mute your mic, all participants. Okay. So uh, the energy units uh, for this electromagnetic waves, you can write it as e is equal to H nu or is it uh, nu is equal to C by lambda. So C it should be capital C. Some, uh, it is uh, capital H C, uh, small uh, H capital C by lambda, H C by lambda. This is uh, this equation, you know, H is Planck's constant and lambda is the wavelength of light, which we which we are uh, considering. So uh, only this lambda is variable here. These two are constants. So if you substitute these things and from wavelength to energy, energy to wavelength, you can easily convert it. Okay. So if you want to characterize any material, if you try to make some material. So, and if you want to study its uh, structure, properties, or many other things, there are many uh, characterization techniques are available, both uh, microscopy and spectroscopy. There are two different techniques that are available. Microscopy, basically, it gives information about the uh, structure, morphology, okay? And, uh, and uh, sometimes um, the microscopy, uh, can tell you the composition that is available with that one. Morphology, basically how it looks in my minute scale. So those things, and there are many techniques like optical microscope, SM, TEM, uh, IFM, FIM, uh, STM, XRD, XRT, okay, atomic force microscope. So these, these are all uh, the latest uh, techniques that are available. To, in order to see the morphology, how they are looking at uh, minute scale and uh, what could be their composition and other things, uh, crystal structure and using electron diffraction uh, coupled with microscopy, you can study all these things. But spectroscopy is a technique where you can know the chemical composition, exact chemical composition, even if one of the components uh, lies in uh, parts per million parts per billion very less when you don't know that much is present there or not so that much of uh, thing also can easily be uh, detected using spectroscopic techniques and if there is a slight variation in the composition that also you can find it out of course the crystal structure and the photoelastic uh, electric properties of the materials and many other things you can find it out because this is more sensitive technique very very sensitive and good information you can get it with this so uh, as i told uh, along with the microscopy techniques and diffraction techniques if you have this energy dispersive x-ray spectroscopy wavelength dispersive x-ray spectroscopy xrd mass spectroscopy 
sims and time of flight sims e, uh, yields uh, energy uh, electron energy loss spectroscopy so there are many other spectroscopy few i have listed here they are very important and similarly uh, photon emission spectroscopy is also uh, widely used by most of the material scientists so uh, for the optical spectroscopy if you if you take a material and then some uh, photons uh, are put on that material so what you can see is the scattering that is called the rayleigh scattering you may get it or you may get raman uh, scattering or uh, the the photons may uh, go through the material and transmission uh, spectroscopy is transmission spectroscopy or photoluminescence spectroscopy there are different types of uh, optical spectroscopies that are available but we are talking about the fluorescence spectroscopy which uh, will be very interesting to see because for other things you may have to have very sophisticated instrumentation for this one uh, for most of the time your eyes are the detector you can see the photoluminescence with your naked eye so once it is uh, good then you can go for the sophisticated instrument so that's why this has got a lot of importance and using spectroscopic techniques so these are the various uh, things you can detect you can detect impurities you can detect the dislocations you can detect the defects you can uh, defect density you can calculate you can find out the structure of organic compounds. I'm not talking about the organic things now, only inorganic things uh, I'm uh, concentrating here in my talk. So qualitative and quantitative analysis you can do about the material. Chemical kinetics, you can find it out. Uh, you can Sometimes you can find out the functional groups like infrared spectroscopy if you use, not photoluminescence. If you use infrared spectroscopy, then you can find out the functional groups that are attached to that so even the analysis of pharmaceutical drugs where the composition can be you can estimate it so molecular weight also you can determine and hplc detection high performance liquid chromatography also you can detect it band gap also you can calculate so there are many things so uh, Using uh, uh, photoluminescence spectroscopy, you may not have all these things. Most of the things are, can be calculated. But uh, using other spectroscopic techniques, it's a general thing for all spectroscopic techniques. This, these are the many important uh, applications or important uh, finding uh, find outs you can uh, easily calculate it. Okay. So coming back to the photoluminescence spectroscopy, let me concentrate a small portion of spectroscopy. So, so as I told that a material, if it emits, it is uh, the light which you are going to see. So what are the very uh, fundamental uh, processes to generate light? Can anybody tell me how to generate light? Very fundamental thing. From the audience. Okay, so uh, let me tell you what is the general thing like if you take a metal piece like iron and heat it for very high temperature, then the metal starts emitting light, isn't it? So that is the usual thing which we see. So that is called thermal radiation. If you heat a material to very high temperature, it starts emitting red light. And even if you increase the temperature of the uh, metal, then it may start emitting blue light from red it will shift it to yellow and then still it it will shift it to uh, blue or green green and then blue so the energy of blue is much high it means if you are providing more and more heat your material will be the metal will be showing that much uh, light before melting okay and the other process is luminescence okay these are two different processes and uh, you may be thinking that what about uh, radioactivity? Radioactivity, see here in, in this both processes one and two, you are using some external source, whether you are he heating the material by providing heat in luminescence, you are providing some ultraviolet radiation or some radiation on the material which is emitting visible light. In both the cases, you are getting visible light, but there is some external source. In radioactivity, 
it's an inherent uh, thing you know you don't no need to uh, excite it it's already emitting from its own so uh, uh, radio uh, radioactivity is not a luminescence process okay and there's a degradation of the material half life and other things but here we don't have such type of things there is no degradation of material so the ultimate uh, source of light you know it is sun so what are the lighting technologies people have experienced the first generation is fire when man invented fire in, in uh, long back so that became as a uh, source of uh, uh, light light and uh, for moving in the uh, night times or uh, to have uh, his food burned on that that one cooked on on that fire so this was the first generation of lighting uh, sources and the second generation of lighting sources is incandescent lamp so thomas alva edison uh, discovered a, this one in 1879 accidentally it was discovered but later on the incandescent lamps were replaced by mercury vapor lamps and sodium vapor lamps which you use in our laboratory okay so these are called second generation lamps third generation lamps are the fluorescent lamp tube lights that we use in our uh, household and CFLs, compact fluorescent lamps, which were in 1997. So where uh, uh, low pressure mercury is being put in those lamps. OK, so this was the, these were the things. And the fourth generation uh, of that one is nothing but the light emitting diodes, solid state lighting or light emitting diodes, you can say. So these uh, light emitting diodes See from first generation to fourth generation, if you see here, we are not concerned with light. So light is less, heat is more in first generation. In the second generation also, if you see almost 10% light is there and 90% heat. The bulb, if you see, which you use in our, uh, uh, maybe in kitchen or bathrooms. So this, uh, this, this in casino lamp, they are very uh, inexpensive, very cheap you can have it in 10 rupees a bulb so you see that light is less and more heat is generated okay and so as you proceed further the fluorescent lamps they are more energy efficient compared to incandescent lamps so fluorescent lamps about 60 percent they give light and 40 percent of uh, heat and other forms of energy we don't know what are these so cfl is still better than uh, fluorescent lamps okay so now LED, when LED lighting, if you use the thing about uh, 85 to 90, 95% of light we are getting out. The electrical to light energy conversion is about 90%. 85 to 95% of uh, that one will be light and only 5 to 10% is the heat and other uh, things. So more and more light we are uh, we are getting. So that's why we, uh, government is also urging use to, to use this LED LED lights because it is more energy efficient. Uh, maybe a 12 watt bulb is equivalent to uh, the fluorescent uh, lamp of 40 watt. Okay, so that much light it it can give. So they are more energy efficient and life also. If you see from here to here the life also has increased tremendously okay so the same uh, then uh, why thermal radiation is not considered as a photoluminescence because a metal is heated it emits electromagnetic radiation that's what the red hot iron which i told okay but one thing you need to remember that if you are heating the metal to very high temperatures then the color of the emission also is changing means the color of emission is directly proportional to the temperature you are providing. But in luminescence, in photoluminescence, it does not depend on temperature. You, there is uh, like if you are uh, giving excitation, the emission will be same. Even if you increase the uh, flux of excitation, your emission will not change. And for example, for the same uh, incandescent lamp, so we use tungsten, tungsten as the metal in that, is it not? So tungsten, why you use tungsten metal in the as a filament in the uh, those lamps, incandescent lamps? Because 
tungsten has got the maximum melting point the melting point of this tungsten filament because uh, a bulb operates at 3000 kelvin because vacuum will be there inside at 3000 kelvin that is the temperature of the filament so in order to sustain this much of high temperature only tungsten we can use tungsten melting point is 3683 kelvin whereas the operating temperature is 3000 okay this is highest of all among all metals that's why we cannot use aluminium or copper or any other so only tungsten is used because of high melting point that's why if a high current passes through this bulb it fuses means the uh, the temperature may go beyond the melting uh, if a high current passes that's why it breaks sometimes uh, after usage you see that suddenly the bulb uh, the filament breaks that is because there is uh, it might have reached beyond the melting point suddenly so it has melted at that position so it becomes uh, i mean the uh, filament breaks so that's the, the reason so that's why thermal radiation is not considered as luminous okay so because it is changing with the wavelength, changing with the temperature you provide. Then what is luminescence? Then the question comes, then how exactly we can understand what is this luminescence or photoluminescence? The luminescence is a process, non-thermal type of process. There is no heat generation in that. It's a cool process where you take a material and then uh, shine uh, some invisible radiations. For example, alpha, beta, gamma, ultraviolet. These are the wavelengths we cannot, we cannot see. So if some invisible radiation falls on certain material and that material emits visible light, visible light which we can see. For example, this one. So the, this is an example of uh, photoluminescence uh, from minerals, rocks. If you go to seashore or uh, river bank, you may get a lot of uh, corals, small stones, colored stones and other things. So those things, if you put under uh, ultraviolet light, so sometimes uh, they they show a very beautiful color. These are these these are the various uh, you can see some collected from seashore. So many things, if uh, even marbles also sometimes pieces of marble, just put it. So some are glowing very bright red, bright green, okay, red, orange, yellow, many other things. Nothing has been done. Nature nature has done directly. Maybe due to volcano eruption or maybe uh, due to diffusion of uh, various dopants, minerals that are present in the earth. So they have get into that rock and you know, the rocks are giving when you put it under ultraviolet 365 nanometers. So this is how it is glowing. Similarly, these are man-made synthesized materials in the laboratory. They are the standard uh, materials which we use in uh, televisions and uh, tube lights and many other things. So these are the short names like uh, BAM is barium magnesium aluminate. Okay, so uh, barium magnesium and doublet magnesium and so on. There are may, may, they are all commercial names and under room light they look like this. This is the body color. And under ultraviolet, if you put it at ultraviolet, UVC basically UVC. 254 nanometers you see this powder will glow violet this is showing blue this is showing green yellow dark yellow orange red so all seven colors people have made this is artificially made so this we are going to learn today so how to make this type of materials okay uh, don't be confused with the body color and the photoluminescence photoluminescence you need to have ultraviolet light if by shining ultraviolet light, if you see such colors, then uh, that is photoluminescence. If you see under room light, it is it is only the body color. Okay. So how how do you understand this phenomena? Like uh, you are uh, you are shining uh, this these materials, whether natural or man-made materials, uh, with ultraviolet. This is blue line. So absorption takes place. Uh, the materials will absorb and uh, the electron goes to the higher energy state and there are closely sp spaced uh, energy levels. So electron slowly comes back to the lowest of the conduction band and from where it, it, it drops, okay? So that's why the ultraviolet energy is a higher energy radiation, whereas visible light is a low energy. Whatever we are getting is a lower energy compared to that. 
so this is the same you can understand like you can uh, give a lot of push to a person to get to the higher energy state and he will step back to the lowest of the conduction band and he is jumping back here the energy is less okay so where does the excess energy goes this goes as uh, phonons okay that is vibrations or something it will be lost in that so we need to uh, understand the band gap of these materials if, the, if you understand the band gap then no need to give very high energy and pump it to a very high level of these electrons you can pump it to the minimum level and then you can get back the energy in different fashion so this is how you can understand the luminescence process and you know that uh, you might have studied in your uh, class uh, 10th or in uh, during plus two so fluorescence and phosphorescence fluorescence is the process uh, where the instantaneous emission like if you are shining an ultraviolet light and immediately you are getting another wavelength another visible wavelength coming back from the material it is called fluorescence and the time of duration is 10 power minus 8 seconds whereas phosphorescence is a delayed fluorescence delayed fluorescence means it takes time to come out and then it it stays for longer time for example if if you are giving excitation energy to certain electrons so it will absorb and it will go to the high energy state and relax back to the ground state okay instantaneously the electron jumps to the balance band then it's called fluorescence but if it finds some uh, some other energy levels maybe created by doping or the material has some other energy levels close which are close to the uh, conduction band so electron instead of jump jumping that high it will take this path and it will slowly come back to the lowest of these levels and then it will come out so this intersystem crossing will delay the emission so that's why uh, after glow or you can see the material uh, glowing for longer time so earlier it was few seconds uh, as per the definition uh, uh, greater than 10 power minus 5 seconds to few seconds it, it was called fluorescence but now scientists have achieved very very long fluorescence that even days once the excitation is given the phosphorescence goes for few days also okay so we have been working on both type of materials and here is just an example which i am showing it to you that this is one of the quantum dots we have made using zinc sulfide doped with manganese here you see it's a fluorescent material it looks very uh, transparent like water uh, under room light but if i put it under ultraviolet lamp so because of manganese it emits red okay this liquid uh, emits red and it's an inst instantaneous process just you remove it from the uh, ultraviolet source immediately it, it, it loses its uh, emission so uh, it is uh, the, the decay time is 10 power minus 8 seconds it's an instantaneous process like here you can see that once uh, it goes to the higher energy state immediately the emission comes okay whereas uh, Phosphorescence, it goes to the higher energy and it transfers inter-system crossing and then it comes out. So this delays the process. And as I told, 10 power minus 5 seconds and above, it is called <coughs> phosphorescence. And this is one of the paints we have developed at, uh, when I was working in NPL. So that was coated as a dial of a clock. So you can see in the night it glows because in the daytime this is a special material which we have coated. It doesn't require any ultraviolet light. You can just uh, put it under sunlight or room light. It will absorb that one, and uh, and and it has a very long uh, emission, long duration of emission. Like it, it can uh, glow uh, around 12 hours. So throughout the night you can see the. Uh, glow of this uh, this one and you can know what is the time okay uh, the intensity will drop little by little uh, uh, it won't maintain for 12 hours it won't maintain the same brightness but brightness uh, will come down but even then you are able to see that so these are the examples of that 
so this is about a brief history of this uh, phosphorus sometimes i am uh, calling it as luminescent material and sometimes i am calling it as phosphor okay it is not phosphorus phosphorus is an element in the periodic table uh, atomic number 15 okay phosphorus is different and phosphor is different phosphorus is an element in the periodic table whereas phosphor is a compound okay but why similar name why why can't we have a different thing so there is a small story behind that ancient Greeks uh, when they were uh, looking at sky and predicting many things you know, similarly they, they used to see uh, some rocks uh, they were uh, glowing in the dark they thought it could be ore of phosphorus so when it comes in contact with the moisture and uh, uh, air uh, oxygen so those uh, those things may be burning so that was the property of phosphorus so they thought it is the burning of phosphorus so later on they could see that every day it is glowing and with time it is the intensity is decreasing because if something is burning it should not uh, glow next day also na? so they were, they were confused and they, they once again they started checking and they thought it is radioactive but it is not radioactive every day it is uh, gaining the sunlight and in the uh, night it is glowing uh, earlier uh, the early time it was so bright and after that it is decreasing intensity and so on then uh, since they thought it is phosphorus so they they have uh, cut short the name as phosphor they have cut short the name phosphorus to phosphor but phosphor is a compound phosphorus is a element in the period both are different okay and, and uh, in the 19th century itself, Herschel, when he did some experiment related to this quinine solution, okay, quinine is an organic compound in solution. So when he has kept and uh, when sunlight falls through this uh, some filter, blue glass that was there on the church, so uh, out of all radiation, so it has uh, it's like a, a bandpass filter. It has uh, emitted uh, only blue light falling on this one. When this blue, blue violet or blue ray uh, uh, felt on that, that one, then you could see different colors coming out of that wine glass. There was a wine glass also. Then he, he, was, he was looking uh, this emission through this. This is another filter. So he could see that a uh, uh, lot of colors uh, that are changing with wine and without that. And, so then he could see that there is something like usually in sunlight or in normal light quinine solution doesn't give fluorescence but this having this uh, ultraviolet or uh, some blue light type of uh, light when it is falling a lot of bright fluorescence is observed so that was the first thing uh, he could uh, see it in 19th century and uh, as i told that uh, before that itself uh, the bologna stone which is called barium sulfide so this barium sulfide is the material which was glowing in the rocks. There could be some uh, unintentional doping by nature itself, but these are the stones which are glowing in the night when these Greeks have seen. So it was first, uh, they, it was observed in 1609, but uh, the name was given by white man uh, in 1888. Okay. So uh, after that, after barium sulfide, uh, scientists uh, started working on zinc sulfide, another sulfide material doped with copper. So with this one, uh, people could achieve about 40 minutes of uh, decay time. Here, few minutes only. So 40 minutes and by adding a little bit of cobalt, again, they could improve, improve it to about one hour, one hour glow in the dark, completely dark. So uh, this was the thing so it was uh, having a great advantage these type of sulfides after that people started working on other sulfides like strontium sulfide calcium sulfide also bismuth sulfide all sulfides they found they thought all sulfides uh, they have this type of uh, characteristic and they can emit uh, they are excitable by sunlight that is the main advantage they don't require any ultraviolet or any other uh, external source and uh, but the main problem was they are chemically unstable because sulfides when they come in contact with the moisture it releases h2s gas and then it will become oxide material 
so this was the main uh, instability feature was there with sulfides so they thought it's only the sulfides which can go this type of things and during uh, second world war there was uh, some other uh, type of phosphorus people have developed that is called photo stimulated phosphorus so this is another uh, interesting uh, phosphor material like they made some phosphors and they coat it on white paper it looked like powder has been coated on that one the beauty of this uh, photo stimulated uh, phosphors is that one can uh, write some message using some laser and which will be stored see like you can write a secret message on that uh, uh, paper which is coated with this phosphor so that message is stored and again if you uh, send that information to the your uh, boss or uh, during the war, war time that fellow used to put that uh, sheet under uh, ultraviolet of particular frequency then he could read out what exactly matter was there so it was like storage phosphor it was storing that information and again uh, he, he could eliminate uh, all the thing and he he can write another message and it can send it only the enemies whoever gets that one they they, they think that it's a piece of paper but it was the communication that people have done in, uh, during that time so that is called photo stimulated phosphor but after the second world war then this research also stopped then once again people got interest in this one with uh, in 90s when uh, matsuzawa a famous scientist in from japan he developed some oxide materials which can show this afterglow or phosphorescence property for more than uh, a few more than one hour the like green it was about 10 hours uh, blue it was 1 to 2 hours and red is about 15 minutes of afterglow or phosphorescence time so then people started think oh even the oxides also can show they earlier they were thinking only sulfides can show but oxides and other materials also so then people started working with lot of uh, rare earth materials and lot of oxide materials still people are working and with the advent of this uh, nanotechnology when you make these particles in nano regime some unusual properties uh, people could see and still the research is going very strong like for example the quantum dots which i have shown you earlier slide so the, it looks like water in usual case but if you shine ultraviolet it looks red okay that is because of the quantum dot emission so and that is that will be very very strong and the uh, material that is there in that liquid is only few mil, uh, micrograms even not a gram it's micrograms of that one that is giving that much strong emission so the uh, usually these materials whatever uh, we make it oxide sulfide they are like powder materials okay you can put it in some paint and then you can paint it on the wall or on the various substrates but uh, quantum dots if you can make these materials in terms of quantum dots then it will be transparent you can coat it on any glass you doesn't know that it is being coated with a phosphor unless uh, some ultraviolet light if you shine then automatically it, you can see the glow otherwise it looks like normal glass so there are various advantages have come into picture okay so depending upon the source of excitation they, they are named in different uh, types like uh, photoluminescence photo as the name says photon photon is light so if you are using ultraviolet and if the emission is in the visible region the emission means the color whatever we see if you are shining ultraviolet and if you see the emission that is called photoluminescence instead of photoluminescence if you apply electric field either ac or dc okay so then uh, for example uh, your uh, cell phones cell phones there is a battery at the back so when you switch on then you see glow in that material so that is called electroluminescence this one if it, that could be ac electroluminescence or dc electroluminescence in, in uh, cell phones it is dc electroluminescence so instead of uh, electric field if you are using electrons like old type of uh, tv sets or monitors uh, we used to have bulkier uh, thing uh, there is electron gun at the back old tvs also okay so whatever uh, glow you can see on the screen is called cathode luminescence because the cathode rays electrons are falling on the screen and if x-rays are falling and if you see the visible luminescence that is called x-ray luminescence 
when you see ultrasound or something then it is called sonoluminescence when you use some solvents and photons then it is called salvatoluminescence and there is some chemiluminescence chemiluminescence is the one where uh, uh, see you you know about the exothermic and endothermic reaction like exothermic when you uh, add two chemicals a and b then if heat is generated then it, you call that that reaction as exothermic and if uh, if it is cooled down then it is called endothermic then that means heat is a form of energy instead of heat why can't light can come out of that reaction so there are certain reaction where light comes out so that is called chemiluminescence okay for example uh, uh, chemiluminescence in the laboratory you can make it or uh, i can tell you a simple uh, example uh, this uh, i don't know what is being added in mountain dew cool drink mountain dew if you take so there is a slight yellowish color tinge is there in that so that is some uh, compound what what they exactly add i don't know but that is fluorescent so that one if you add a, a little bit of uh, uh, the household uh, uh, soda so khane wali soda hota hai na so that soda if you can add a little bit a pinch of soda and uh, hydrogen peroxide h2o2 hydrogen peroxide do tin matlab 10 ml dal denge in that uh, bottle uh, containing not a full bottle but a half uh, or very little of uh, mountain dew and if you can mix it up and uh, and uh, switch off the lights and you can see there's a beautiful glow a very uh, blue, bright glow you can see that's a chemiluminescence and sometimes uh, you add more of uh, baking soda then gas may come out so it is better that you remove the cap okay of course carbon dioxide also there in that uh, cool to cool drink so this is small experiment one can do and you can see this uh, mountain dew experiment uh, in youtube also you can see how beautifully people have done with that one and bioluminescence bioluminescence is uh, jugnu the fireflies so you might have seen in the fields sometimes uh, in the night uh, you see this jugnu uh, the emitting uh, bright color for few seconds and then it will go go off and again it will glow and so on so that is a chemical which it secretes like humans secrete uh, sweat they secrete a organic chemical called luciferin luciferin is a organic compound but it is uh, fluorescent so what what does uh, the the heat of the uh, insect is taken as the excitation energy and the uh, jugnu will uh, that heat from the body it will go to the uh, that uh, chemical luciferin and then uh, it will glow and when the body temperature goes down it will disappear and again when the when because of flying it gains uh, heat energy that uh, body of that insect so that energy is again transferred to that that's why it is glowing and it is disappearing and again it is glowing and again it is disappearing so that is called bioluminescence okay and some sea fungi also some uh, in some of the ocean sometimes they see algae and other thing they are also showing lot of bright blue luminescence so that is uh, that they are also uh, bioluminescence even in jellyfish and others so they they show glow so that is also bioluminescence so if you using mechanical energy and then uh, if you see there is a glow that is called triboluminescence or mechanoluminescence so there are many types of sources so if you use that one and if you see uh, the effect the visible light coming out of that then you you, have, you can name that one these are few things i have highlighted but we are concentrating on photoluminescence for this lecture so in my career uh, the both uh, phosphors and uh, nano phase of these materials nano phosphors also i have developed and many developmental projects were done with the drdo basic pro research was done with the dsc projects and some exploratory novel type of taps and csr taps and projects also i have developed so there color tv from right from color tv phosphors when earlier there it was uh, black and white tvs or monochrome tvs you can call because only single phosphor was coated later on color tv phosphors we have made and long decay means long uh, fluorescent long after glow 
uh, or you can say longest uh, uh, phosphorescent phosphors. So the called LD phosphors, we named it as LD. Uh, gadolinium oxysulfide screens for X-ray phosphors, electroluminescent lamp, I told uh, the, but uh, you know, this uh, all smartphones, they have got very good uh, displays, uh, multicolor displays. Uh, they are uh, DC electroluminescent uh, lamps. Whereas uh, we are developing AC electroluminescent lamps, means uh, that lamps does not have filament in that. So only you can plug it. So uh, small A4 size paper sheet may be taking one watt of power, but you can see the illumination is quite high. So that is the futuristic lamps which we are developing, like quantum dots, nanocrystals, nanocomposites, band gap engineering, novel nanophosphors. We are uh, exploring some anti-reflection coatings, transparent oxides, hydrophobic um, uh, materials. So many things we are working and uh, not only luminescence, but other type of uh, things also I am working. But uh, let me concentrate more on this photoluminescent phosphor. These are the summary what you can say. This, uh, these are all materials developed by me. So these are the long afterglow materials which are glowing in the dark. Once the light is switched off, they are glowing in the dark. And these are uh, red, blue, green emitting uh, phosphate nanophosphors. They are used for, useful for bio labeling, uh, biological applications. And this uh, red, blue, green uh, materials were developed for Nimitli project and which were used in PDP TVs, plasma TVs. Of, of course, now plasma TVs were obsolete. LED TVs have come into picture, but uh, for that uh, reason, uh, when the Plasma TVs have come into the market. Then at that time there was a lot of issues with the various colors because plasma energy was quite high, so it was deteriorating blue and uh, green. So we have solved that problem for uh, that uh, company called uh, Samtel in Ghaziabad. So we worked with them and we we have given our material which they have put up in their TVs, television. So, and uh, dilute magnetic semiconductors also we have studied. Quantum dot, we are the first to modulate uh, color in zinc oxide quantum dots. Usually, uh, you type uh, quantum dots in, uh, in the Google, you may get uh, cadmium selenide or cadmium sulfide, beautiful colored materials, is it not? But as for uh, in zinc oxide, we could not reach uh, red, but uh, dark green to uh, blue. So this was tuning for the first time we have made it in 2008 and it was appreciated globally also. And not only this ma making these materials at a very small scale, we, we, we had a pilot plant where cages, cages of uh, phosphor material was uh, made and which uh, the, uh, once we made this type of uh, setup very big, uh, which will cover the entire room. There was a staircase also to go to the top. Uh, so big stirrers and uh, the precipitates were uh, getting in this bottom, this one big bubblers, generator, many things were there. So this uh, pilot plant, uh, finally we have transferred to ISRO because uh, they wanted to make the material in cages. Okay, way back in uh, 2000 or 2001, we transferred this one. So phosphor nanowires also we have grown. We have made flexible and rigid type of electroluminescent AC electroluminescent panels. We have made it transfer to uh, DRDO and uh, some uh, uh, blue and green emitting uh, nanophosphors we have developed using combustion technique and some phosphors we have we have been using for target drug delivery systems. Okay, put a magnet and all the fluorescent material is collected at this one. It is both fluorescent and magnetic. So these are useful for uh, target drug delivery systems. So that we have developed and LEDs we have made. Okay, biological applications also we have studied like core shell structures, and, uh, tetrapods. And uh, this is one of the interesting work which we did it in uh, 2010, around 2010. So these were the culture plates of uh, E. coli, control plates of E. coli bacteria. So most of the time, the nano materials, uh, they say that they have got a lot of surface defects and uh, uh, less of oxygen is present. So we have made zinc oxide quantum dots. And in that one, we dipped the culture plate. 
and within few seconds you see the colonies have died these colonies where if the oxygen is there then they uh, <coughs> multiply they multiply into uh, still bigger numbers but it is dying means there is no oxygen present there and if you increase the concentration of zinc oxide all the colonies died so the bacterial uh, this thing this uh, in, a, in a indirect way of proving that zinc oxide uh, have less of oxygen more of zinc present in the that so this was appreciated by nature uh, also and for solar cells also we have made transparent like this is a test tube having liquid with the uh, quantum dots of uh, gadolinium vanadate uh, uh, yttrium vanadate so normally if you shine uh, ultraviolet light you see cone effect cone type of uh, spread of the light in the test tube but here it is directly going through that one illuminating the liquid so that means straight lay straight way it is going means this indicates that uh, there is no scattering means the particles are smaller than the wavelength of uh, the incident light means they are very very small so if they are small they become transparent and the light can pass through that one without this cone type of effect so that's the indication here so this is the summary what uh, whatever the is now let us understand how to make these these type of materials in our laboratory okay how we can easily determine this so understanding these materials so as i told that uh, these uh, fluorescent materials or luminescent materials or in short it is called phosphor phosphor essentially has a host crystal any any particular crystal you need to take and some of the atoms like this is the one of the atom you replace it with another uh, uh, activator or luminescent center where which is the one which is emitting the color okay so uh, let us uh, first understand what is a phosphor then i'll tell you what lattices one has to choose and what uh, ions we have to put so that we can get different colors okay so a luminescent material will have a crystal and some of the uh, the atoms are replaced by an activator activator or dopant is same so this is the dopant which is placed here and most 99% uh, the host crystal itself acts as an absorber when ultraviolet light absorbed photo photon falls on that one and it will transfer that energy to the activator which will give the light the excitation and the excitation of this activator will give you the light for that material but in uh, one to two percent of crystals uh, they don't like to absorb then you need to add an another activator or a sensitizer it is called it is like an antenna it will absorb whatever light is falling on that one and it will transfer this energy transfer it will transfer that energy to the activator which will show the light okay so how do you understand this process so uh, from valence this is valence band this is conduction band if you are just taking a pure material and then if you are exciting with a certain ultraviolet energy so electron goes to the high energy state and it comes back so this is called band edge emission because from band gap to band gap Okay, from the conduction band to the valence band, it is dropping. So it is called band edge emission or band gap emission. But in real sense, you don't find a perfect crystal like this. So you may have a crystal with an activator, some dopant or some defect level or trap level. Some levels should be there. So always the they will take the shortest path. So electron jumps to this activator or from uh, it will go to the trap and from trap it may come down or from trap it goes to conduction band and it comes down so these are various possible mechanisms that are available in luminescence and once you uh, get some luminescent material so again uh, there is another system called photometry and colorimetry so with this one you need to this is only for visible light so why this uh, chromaticity diagram has been devised by the scientists because see uh, the color uh, if i ask what is the color of this one you will say it is green okay and if i ask the same uh, what is this color say it is also green you say it is dark green here it is light green but here this is also green 
so there is a discrepancy in uh, discussion like uh, this color you say blue and this color also you say blue but there is a difference between these two colors is it not so they have devised a, a chromaticity diagram and they are given different shades like this is called blue is a greenish blue bluish green blue green green yellowish green yellow green yellow so the, in in common terminology we use uh, we loosely use light green or pale green or uh, blue green greenish blue all uh, have different uh, meaning greenish blue green blue bluish green green they are all different you see the color variation so once you uh, make the material and if you plot a graph spectral graph <coughs> between intensity on y axis versus wavelength you will get a spectrum that spectral data if you substitute in this uh, photometry thing then you will uh, uh, if the coordinates if the, the coordinates lies in this in this region that this you can call it as green so whenever you are making such material like asian paints we go to asian paints there are lot of shades they show okay and there is some code given at the bottom similarly here also whenever you make a phosphor like green phosphor you 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 tell that it's a green phosphor having a color coordinates of x and y you put this point uh, 2 you can say point 2 and then point 5 means somewhere here you can put a dot and you can say that these are the coordinates and the color is green so this is a universally people will adopt that one and of course the mixture of all the colors will give you white and white also this the central white is perfect white or ideal white and the white which is near to this corner is uh, reddish uh, means white with little red rich and here it is blue rich sometimes you go to a jewelry shop and you see that the light emitted by uh, the light uh, the, the lightings they use is white light but it is more of yellow color because they wanted to show the gold is uh, glowing much more higher so they prefer to take a bulb uh, having white light but uh, the co coordinate somewhere here so near to yellow similarly aajkal to wo sabzi sabzi wale ke paas bhi jaiye mirch lena hai to mirch ke upar green color ka light dala rehta hai so that is just to bluff you that it is more uh, uh, green or more blue or more yellow so those are the things so this is also very important in terms of uh, photoluminescence spectroscopy okay so one thing you need to remember that uh, a material whatever material you take it should not be conductor because conductor does not have a band gap okay either semiconductor or insulator are good for our photoluminescence studies so if you have a very small band gap it's good and if you have a larger band gap it is still good It's more good because in a single lattice you can have different colors. But here you can you cannot have more uh, number of uh, acceptor donor pairs here. For example, here you can see here you may if it is the band gap is very small like semiconductor, you can have an acceptor level or a donor level. So the emission is fixed. Whereas in insulator you can uh, you can you can vary the activator. like you can put manganese you can put copper aluminum bismuth many other so each one will produce its own levels not simultaneously means uh, same band gap material same host material you can take and from that you can draw many colors whatever color you want you can get it so insulators are always good for us the host should be having larger and larger band gap for example here i have taken zinc sulfide so zinc sulfide this zinc sulfide is having a band gap of 3.6 electron volt so if i dope it with silver in that zinc sulfide zinc sulfide doped with silver i get blue emission blue zinc sulfide uh, silver is blue but inst instead of this one if i don't take silver and if i put copper i'll get red uh, green very good green similarly if i if i don't use copper or silver and use manganese same zinc sulfide earlier i have shown that it gives red color that means host is same 
but if you can play with the activators you can have whatever color you want you can get it out of all the visible light so that is the beauty so large band gap is always required and this is some color wheel which i got it in the internet which says that a material which absorbs violet light will give yellow yellow emission and the one which absorbs blue light will give orange emission which absorbs green light will give red emission somehow it is true for all phosphors till now if the absorption lies in the violet region then that emits yellow this is a somebody has made this one but uh, uh, it seems to be true for all phosphors still now okay and now we we could understand that the host should have uh, larger and larger band gap and insulators are better compared to semiconductors okay that is one thing we have learned now what should be the activators or luminescent ions so luminescent ions when when you are doping that material or that uh, uh, dopant into that lattice okay so if uh, uh, for example uh, uh, manganese or antimony or cerium europium they they get they get influenced by the lattice means lattice most of the time it will be inert it will loan it will not take part in any of the reaction just it will absorb the ultraviolet radiation and transfer it to the dopant but in certain cases the host will not sit idle the host will say no i will i will also in, influence something so host influence and because of host influence the manganese emission may change from green to red green orange red okay depending upon the host contribution that's why here asterisk stars have been put and here it is written it is called crystal field splitting means crystal the host crystal will have some uh, influence like uh, zeeman and stark effect you might have studied zeeman effect is the influence of uh, splitting of spectral lines in the presence of magnetic field that is zeeman effect and uh, in the presence of uh, electric field is it is stark effect is it not so similarly here if you are doping in certain crystals and if the crystal is influencing its uh, emission then you can get different uh, colors then that is called crystal field splitting in very few uh, ions it will show like this like antimony blue and cerium from uv to red any color depending upon the influence more influence more uh, uh, more more towards red less influence towards left hand side like that but here you see there are other set of uh, ions okay dopants they never bother about crystal whatever crystal you dope it they have fixed color like tamarium if you dope it in any number of any crystal you dope it it will never get influenced by it is very rigid it, it will never get influenced by the crystal and it will show its emission that's it of course the intensity may be little varied a little less or little more so but they are fixed colors they don't change with the crystal okay and let me tell much more in detail about this one and uh, uh, how much activator we need to put that is another question like in a crystal if you are adding an activator ion and it is substituting one of the sides so slowly if i add more and more activator and it will replace many of these sides is it not so how much i have to put see if you put uh, very little then the photons emission will be little bit weak but if you start adding more and more activator your spectrum will be much intensity intensified okay so uh, and after a while you see that the intensity again it is dropping down even though you are increasing because you see when this activator is emitting light okay visible light it is absorbing uh, ultraviolet and emitting visible light when it is emitting visible light the whole or the rest of the crystal will act as a transparent plastic type transparent matrix it will it will just uh, allow the light to go out that's why we, we are able to see that one that's why you see here also one activator is that this will also absorb ultraviolet and it will sh shine color uh, for which the rest of the crystal will be uh, transparent and the light will come out and we can see but if you add a lot of uh, activator in a crystal so what it will happen 
so uh, the the one of the this one is excited by the ultraviolet and the emission is taken away by other uh, other nearby atoms because they are they are uh, the these these are uh, not satisfied with the amount of excitation that it is getting so they are bouquet hai sab ions so they they try to take out the energy they they wanted to take out from the crystal and from the nearby atom so the overall effect is the intensity again comes down so there is some optimum uh, condition like little little by little you have to add you have to see that initially it is like this then it is increased then it is increased then it is increased then it finally increased and after that when it start decreasing you have to stop it okay so otherwise it is called concentration quenching this quenching means losing okay and this is an interesting uh, periodic table of lighting elements so this is in some of the journal i have taken very beautiful thing for our uh, photoluminescence study so here you see that uh, all the activator elements they are marked uh, green so the activator elements are marked green so they are good activators and the purple color are good host elements so these are good host elements and here in some cases it is given both uh, green and uh, purple so that indicates the it can the titanium vanadium they can act as host as well as activator depending upon the amount of amount it is being present in that crystal if it is very less then it will act as activator if it is more it will act as a host okay and the plasma elements the yellow one are plasma elements the 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 discharge of this uh, uh, gases will give you the light that's why you have sodium vapor lamp mercury vapor lamp sulfur vapor lamp and all the noble gases like neon vapor lamp argon krypton xenon vapor vapor lamps and their discharge of this one will give you the light so the, the these plasma elements we are not considering only the host and the activator things and interestingly you see oh, the actinides all are all actinides are uh, radioactive in nature uh, uranium is the only one which gives the luminescence but very rarely people use this one and uh, the lanthanides lanthan all lanthanides you see they are good uh, activators except holmium and promethium holmium also people have uh, studied this is a very old uh, photograph uh, holmium uh, it gives in the infrared region okay earlier by this time when this uh, table was made they may not have used but holmium also gives emission promethium also people studied but very rarely because prometh out of all these uh, rare earth elements promethium is the only poisonous compound so this is very very poisonous like cyanide so people or the guides are afraid of giving pro promethium related research to the students so a, a little uh, unknowingly if you if uh, it it is touched to your hand and uh, you have not washed properly and you have had your food then it will uh, act as a poison and let me kill the student so that's why very less research has been done on this one uh, rest of the things are non 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 hazardous and you see that the f block elements except lutetium all are good activators so what do you understand by this and one more thing what you can see here these are all transition metal ions d block elements d block elements and f block elements they are good activators that means when you see the electronic configuration the nucleus is there s shell s p d f s p d f so the distance between s and p is not in visible region p and d is not in visible region d and f lies in the visible region that means the d block elements if you write the electronic configuration of that one 3d after 3 after 3d what it comes is 4f means d after d it is 4f so electron goes from 3d to 4f and comes back so the distance between d and f lies in the visible region that's why d block elements when you use you get visible light from the material if you don't use d block if you use s block or p block or something else 
you you may get it light but you cannot see that may be in ultraviolet or infrared or some other region okay so d block elements are good similarly f block elements this first line f block elements means after f 4f what is there what is the next level after 4f is 3d okay so the distance between f and d or d and f is same so that lies in the visible region that's why all these rare reds are good activators in the visible region and all uh, this uh, these are magnetic in nature so people have studied these things also nowadays so you can take it as a in general case like transition metal ions and rare earth ions are good activators so you have to choose from these two only so that you will get better uh, visible emission okay and lutetium has got all the uh, four, 14 uh, orbitals filled with electrons f14 so it is completely filled so it 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 it, it acts as more like a uh, lattice a host lattice element not as a activator except this one all have less than 14 so they act as good uh, activators okay so now how how to make this one now we could understand what is an activator uh, what, what to choose an activator and what to choose as a host okay so if you can make powders and if you make phosphors in bulk size means the size of the phosphor material is from 1 to 10 micrometers you can call it as bulk phosphors and if the size in nanometers 1 to 100 nanometers then you can call it as nanophosphors the same material and if it is still less like 1 to 10 nanometers you can call it as quantum dots and nanocrystals and so on whereas uh, if it is uh, 10 to 50 or 10 to 100 you can say then you can have uh, agglomerates agglomerates is a combination of uh, various uh, like uh, motichur laddu type ka. so you have all small things attached at single place that's agglomerate and if you want to know the much more uh, details about various synthesis techniques uh, how you can use it in uh, your laboratory there is an article published in this material research materials uh, science and engineering r reports uh, it was uh, one report was written by my senior colleague um, dr harish chandar it's a single authored one uh, synthesis uh, development of nanophosphors that was the title you just type it it's a free to download and he has elaborated all synthesis techniques whichever you like you can use development of nanophosphors and uh, once you make that one you need to sieve it channi leke sieve karna hai so that big particles will be on the top and small will come down so these things you can use it for certain application like paint or something Gallium oxide, gallium oxide sulfide, yttrium silicate, lanthanum phosphate, strontium aluminate, calcium titanate, uh, yttrium aluminate uh, oxide, which is also called YAG, barium magnesium aluminate, which is BAM, YBO4, uh, vanadate, yttrium borate, and many others. And in all these cases, you can use either transition metal ions or rare earth ions, depending upon your choice. Okay. To get different colors and this is a simple conventional uh, method of preparation for the solid state reaction like you take uh, powders of oxides and activator powder you take just take it mill it grind it in a pestle motor and if you want to mix it uh, very well you can add a little bit of solvent like alcohol or a little bit of acetone you can put it and you can mix this is only for better mixing no, no need for the solvent dry mixing also you can do once you mix it you put you pack it in alumina parts or graphite board and high temperature treatment in a particular atmosphere you give you get the phosphor this is the conventional uh, phosphor preparation technique once the phosphor is made it will be like a stone piece of stone then again you have to grind it to powder sieve it to remove bigger chunks and uh, the final powder you can use it for coating for various applications and so on 
So this is the method of preparation of bulk material. For nano materials, there are many techniques. So why we should go for nano when bulk uh, materials are good? The only thing is bulk, the efficient, here you can see the efficiency, this is the luminescence efficiency. Efficiency of bulk is very good. Most of our displays, we are using the same. When you are uh, decreasing the size of these particles by grinding, then you are losing the, uh, this is uh, the particle size. So you will be losing, but if you can make it in, uh, prepare the same in nano region, then you can see the efficiency is much better than the bulk. Okay, the, the intensity may increase a lot. So there are certain evidences and you can have transparency for these materials. So many other things will come into picture. That's why people go for this nano. And another interesting thing is, for example, uh, here CDSC, the bulk band gap of CDSC is fixed. Whereas if you go to nano or quantum, uh, quantum dot regime, the size determines the color. The smaller uh, uh, sizes will give you red emission and bigger sizes will give you blue and green emissions and so on. The size of the quantum dot, size of the agglomerate will determine the color. So here tunability will come into picture when you go to nano. Whereas in bulk, you have fixed color of emission. This, this I am not talking with respect to dopant. If you dopant, if you put a dopant, the dopant related fixed emission will give. But if you take pure uh, cadmium selenide, here pure cadmium selenide has a fixed band gap and whatever color it gives, that is fixed. Whereas in nano regime, the same uh, cadmium selenide, you can have different color emissions from that. Okay, that's the beauty of that. And methodology, what we adopt, is both synthesis and evaluation techniques here. Synthesis, you can use chemical methods like precipitation methods, soul gel, combustion, page knee, uh, lyophilization, many other techniques you can use, whatever technique. And I'll tell you some of the simple te techniques which we can use it in your laboratory. And evaluation and characterization. For evaluation, both compositional evaluation will do and uh, luminescence evaluation also will do. Compositional will go for XRD for structural determination, SCM, TEM for uh, morphology determination, SIMS for uh, elemental analysis, atomic absorption spectroscopy for elemental analysis. There are various things we, we go for the composition evaluation. Really, we got that material or not. And luminescence characterization like absorption, excitation, emission, decay time, brightness. So these are the things which we will carry out usually in our laboratory so this is just a comparison between phosphor and nanophosphor so i told that sometimes the, we get more and more efficient nanophosphors also this i am skipping this so uh, let me go to the instrumentation part like uh, once you you are able to successfully make uh, such type of materials what are the things how you can use an instrumentation techniques usually when you are uh, want to uh, record the spectrum of such such uh, luminescent material. Uh, two types of lamps are available. One is mercury vapor lamp, another one is xenon vapor lamp. But uh, mostly xenon vapor uh, lamp is being used in spectrometers because mercury vapor lamp earlier they used to use it's also a discharge lamp. But you see some of the wavelengths are missing. It it starts from 200 to 700 nanometers and little bit of higher also. But you see some peaks are very strong and suddenly it is dropping down to zero also here. Suppose your material absorbs in this region and uh, suppose if you calculate or if you measure the absorption of your material, whatever you have developed that material as absorption lies around uh, 495. And if you put it under ultra uh, this mercury lamp, mercury lamp does not have that wavelength. So your material will not glow then you feel that you you, you have uh, your uh, instrument is not working or your sample is not good. Whereas if you see this xenon uh, vapor lamp, it has a very broad spectrum and you don't see any wavelength missing. Of course, there are there is a drop here and again it has come back and it is almost broad. So people go for this type of uh, uh, thing. So there is no sudden drop to zero. So xenon vapor lamps are 
always good or lasers if you have lasers exam or lasers or any other lasers lasers also you can use it for a photoluminescence technique and photoluminescence uh, technique uh, using a spectrometer you can record excitation spectrum emission spectrum both fluorescence mode and phosphorescence mode synchronous spectrum low temperature spectrum many other things can be done similarly lifetime measurements how much time the electron is sitting in the conduction band fluorescence i told it is 10 power minus 8 seconds and phosphorescence it is more than 10 power minus 5 seconds sometimes even hours days i told so how to determine that lifetime so that also using time resolved uh, photoluminescence spectroscopy we can estimate the time of sitting of this electron in the higher energy state conduction band so that also one can require so chemistry people they use it for uh, uh, some other uh, testing like uh, quenchometry, uh, quenchometry surfa uh, surface uh, sur surfactant enhanced luminescence like if you have coating surfactant coating on that one so sensitized measurement chemical de uh, uh, deri derivatization chromatographic and many other things for organic things they use this one and polarization me measurements also whether the light which is coming out of from that material is uh, polarized light or a unpolarized light whether it is a plane polarized circularly polarized or elliptically polarized light all these things one can uh, study uh, with the same uh, luminescence spectrometer okay so simple arrangement is like you have a xenon source and there will be excitation monochromator or you can say wavelength selector you can you can call because all wavelengths are being uh, given here so it will select one particular wavelength to fall on the sample which is kept at an angle of 45 degrees here it is sample holder is at 90 degrees but uh, it will be kept like this uh, 45 degrees angle so light will fall and it will reflect and there is an emission monochromator where it will record that spectrum and there is a detector and a pc will be there where you can see the spectrum so two uh, spectrometers are necessary double beam uh, spectrometers are necessary for uh, photoluminescence characterization suppose you have only one monochromator you don't have the other one what then you can have a filter you can use a source and use a filter so filter will pass only particular wavelength that will fall on the sample but one uh, spectrometer is uh, minimum requirement for photoluminescence study so this is a various uh, other way of showing these things so fluorescence is often viewed at 90 degrees orientation okay so xenon lamp is used so these are the various other uh, ways of showing the sample can be thin film solid sample pellet or liquid also okay so many wavelengths are falling on this monochromator and one wavelength is, it is selecting and it is falling which is called the excitation wavelength so lambda ex that will fall on the sample then the sample will glow with maximum intensity so that will be recorded by the emission monochromator and the detector okay and instead of uh, this arrangement if you use uh, greetings and mirrors then it's called fluorimetry luminescence fluorimetry both are same whether you use prisms or gratings it is same okay so in the instrumentation as i told you can use xenon lamp or you can use lasers and these were the two models which we were having at uh, npl so edinburgh uh, spectro fluorometer where grating and uh, mirrors were used and the other one perkin amal luminescence spectrometer so these two we were using this has a that uh, time resolved uh, uh, capacity also so decay time how much the time the electron is sitting in the conduction band are the defect levels that also we can determine so this is for simple photoluminescence spectroscopy so luminescence spectroscopy i told uh, it's a very sensitive and selective method and uh, detection limits are in ppm and ppb levels intentionally and un unintentionally the some atoms are present in that one that also it will detect and it will show it so all these types of spectrums can be recorded emission excitation synchronous fluorescence and so on so here is a summary what you can see the characteristics of photoluminescence frequencies you can have many frequencies which this is many many peaks if it comes then you can estimate the composition because of uh, what 
uh, what is present, uh, what peak you are going to get. And uh, the width of this uh, or the shift of this peak will tell you the stress and strain that is present in the material and the polarization uh, of that one will give the symmetry and orientation of the crystal. Width of the uh, peak, width, width of the spectrum will give the quality of the spectrum. Means if the width is large, then it is, you cannot say it is a monochromatic or pure color uh, that is emitting from the sample. So it will be uh, the sharper, then the pure color purity will be determined. And the height of the a peak will give you the amount of uh, material that is present or amount of uh, real uh, quantum efficiency or the best material you are going to make. So here you will have an absorption spectrum also called excitation spectrum and this is the emission spectrum. Okay, so th uh, the distance between the peaks of this one will, will, is known as talk shift. So this is how generally it is the, the and one one thing you need to remember that any wavelength you take it from this of course we take the most excited peak wavelength for uh, measuring the photoluminescence but even instead of this one if you take this wavelength also fall if this wavelength is made to fall on the material it will give the same peak but with less intensity maybe here it will have because this uh, this intensity is less compared to this one so this one may give uh, peak like this, but the position will not change. Unlike uh, in thermal radiation, uh, the peak may change, the color of emission will change, but here color of emission should not change. That is the uh, fundamental condition in photoluminescence. If somebody says that I have made material with tunable emissions, like you change the absorption and your emission is changing, then that's a CUDA material, that's a waste material. That's not a fluorescent material. Okay, there are many papers you can see in the um, internet also that uh, I have got a tunable emission like uh, you change the wavelength. If everything is changing, your emission is changing. That means you are not made uh, very good material. Okay, the emission should not change. The excitation may change. The wavelength you can change. But for every wavelength, the intensity may vary, but the position should remain the same. That is the first and foremost condition for Okay, so the, some uh, these are some uh, organic materials which uh, they use it for standardization when you purchase any spectrometer. So they give this type of uh, uh, standards you can use it. Okay, and I'm just switching uh, what are the factors that are responsible for this. Uh, for the earlier like temperature effect will be there, pH effect, if these liquids, filter effects, and all these things you need to take care when you are recording this one. So colorimetric uh, diagram. So earlier I told that uh, green, bluish green, blue green, yellowish green, they are all different. So how to determine this one using photoluminescence spectrum? So I have taken a small example. This is the photoluminescence spectrum of tube light. So it covers from 400 to 700. So all white light, all wavelengths are present. So this, this uh, gives this uh, illuminate to be white light. So some typical household uh, 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 spectrum I have taken. And we have to normalize it to 100. 100% that is 1. You have to normalize it to 1. The highest peak will be 1. And accordingly, the, uh, the intensity numbers will change for the all wavelengths. So here, uh, a difference of 20 nanometers I have taken from 400 to 700. So 400, 420, 440 nanometers. Okay. So for every uh, this thing, so what is the intensity? This phi lambda is the intensity. The 400, this is the intensity value. Because you see around 5, 450, for after 450, 460 or so, you have the peak. So here you see 460 is 0.998. Maybe 461 or 462, it is 1. So normalized to one, this this peak. So one and all will be lesser than that one. Okay. So everything is uh, intensity values is put here. And in the in a, if you take any standard book related to colorimetry, then for each wavelength they have got some standard values. 
that it is indicated standard x and standard y values they put it as a like logarithmic chart they put it at the end in a book so that is called uh, x lambda and y lambda and of course z direction we are not taking but z z z lambda also. so that x lambda is multiplied with this intensity then it is called x lambda phi lambda and if the y uh, coordinate is multiplied with this one you will get this z coordinate multiplied with this one this and here blanks means zero so after that this this is one of the famous methods called equidistant wavelength method of finding this uh, coordinates but there are many other methods also available so if you take the summation of this one it is uh, treated as capital x the summation of this one just addition of this one it is y the addition of this one is given uh, z so x total is x plus y plus uh, z is something else so the x coordinate the here suppose this is the coordinate x coordinate is capital x divided by x plus y plus z so just determine that 0.29 and y is equal to capital y by x plus y plus z that is this 0.34 z anyway we don't have but you can calculate of course this small x small y small z values if you add then that will be one once again so forget about this z value 0.29 and 0.34 so x axis 0.29 and 0.34 so if you uh, see exactly and you can put a dot so this this is the it is not ideal white it is towards a little bit of towards green side of course it is falling in the red, uh, white region so it is white light only but it has a little green more more component of green is present in this one anyway so this one like if I if I want to sell this uh, uh, lamp, then I'll say that it gives white light with coordinates x y is equal to 0 0.29, 0 0.34. Like that, if I, if I say in the international market, then they will understand. Okay, this is giving somewhere here. So if, if the same thing, if you want to sell it to a jeweler uh, jewelry person, he will, he will not take because he prefers the dot to be present somewhere here, no near to yellow. Is it not? Okay, so that's the uh, indication of this one. That's why you can tell. Nowadays, see some uh, CIE, ECIE colorimetric coordinate, color coordinates can be determined using some simple softwares also available in the net. You can search it out and you can put this uh, uh, PL data, photoluminescence data in that one. Then it will directly it will give out the, the calculated values of X and Y. So that also people are using nowadays. So time resolved spectroscopy, as I told that it, it, it gives the lifetime measurement. So how much time the electron is resting in the higher energy state using uh, liquids also you can determine. And the other way is quantum yield or quantum efficiency. Okay, some known uh, material you have to take. So it has a quantum efficiency of 0 0.9, which is very good. Uh, 0 0.9 is 90%. So if you measure the quantum efficiency using this one and again replace that one with your phosphor and then you see and then correlate that. So for quantum efficiency is number of photons emitted to the number of photons absorbed. So how do you count the number of photons? So there will be a photon counting system attached to the uh, spectrometer. So when we shine light through the, uh, through, from the source uh, to that, so it will count number of photons the counter will count so number of photons that are coming in and falling into the material and when the material is emitting again there will be a photon counting system before the detector so it will count so number of photons emitted or uh, to the number of photons absorbed that gives you the quantum efficiency so there is no phosphor with 100 percent quantum efficiency but it is near to uh, near to one like here it is 90 percent or something so here we can determine. so little bit more uh, maybe another five minutes i'll take uh, just to show you some beautiful applications of these luminescent materials so luminescent materials here few applications I have highlight, highlighted that fluorescent lamps the white powder coating which is there in the cfl and tube lights so they are uh, phosphor materials only the red blue green coatings that are there in plasma tvs that is phosphor to improve the solar cell efficiency you can have some transparent coatings that is nanophosphor 
luminous paints that glow in the dark. So they are also phosphor materials. CRT cathode ray displays, uh, earlier displays. Nowadays, uh, nobody is using this type of thing. Electron, gun, and everything is there. So that is also a display. Solid state lighting is LEDs, where that uh, light is em emitted from the uh, blue chip, and yellow phosphor is kept. So we'll, you are getting white light and field emission TVs. So these are the future uh, foldable TVs or very thin TVs and biomedical applications like target drug delivery system many other things so some of my students are working they have worked in this type of uh, systems and uh, some uh, some people they have submitted their thesis and some are still working so there are various applications uh, that are there and uh, let me show you uh, how this uh, is good for white led so you know that all the three colors primary colors uh, will give you white light but you know that we have got very good blue led and if you diagonally you see here yellow so yellow phosphor you if you have and if you put that yellow phosphor on blue led chip then you'll get white light okay so white light uh, like here blue chip and uh, yellow phosphor has been put in here so you will get white light but only the problem with this white light is uh, it has blue component and it has got a green component but there is less of red component that's why you don't feel like studying under uh, 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 this uh, LED lighting. Suppose uh, if you put LED lighting in your house, <coughs> and if you feel that something is missing, that is the red portion is missing. That's why uh, people are uh, working to no. develop newer and newer uh, red materials. Mm -hmm. The problem uh, is not with the red material, but that the red material should should mm -hmm. absorb blue light, not ultraviolet. So that is the important thing one has to do. So if you can uh, do that one, then we can have better and better pictures on uh, and we, people will be happy to have th those type of lighting in in the in their houses okay there are various leds which we have developed in our laboratory like uh, uh, coated on white plate and uh, glass plate and put it on uh, led chip and so on okay so the other important application is solar cell efficiency we have got solar cell. we are not changing the structure of solar cells the same solar cell whatever you want you can take it but you see the this uh, gray portion is this this portion is the actual solar light sunlight and our solar cell works in this region only you know, mostly around uh, 900 nanometers or little ir region our crystalline silicon solar cell has maximum efficiency and this efficiency or ultraviolet and everything is wasted so our phosphor materials will absorb ultraviolet and make it into visible light so what we are doing is we are making a transparent coating and we are coating that uh, uh, material on the silicon uh, solar cell then what will it will happen so whatever ultraviolet light from the sunlight it is falling on that that will be converted to visible light or ir light where the efficiency is maximum the same solar cell will perform very much bright the the electron hole pairs will be too much and then we we'll get more photo current coming out of that so that is the idea with which we, our students are working because you see there is an article in times of india in 2010 or so so this shows that uh, after the tsunami effects the japan they have started to build a very big uh, solar station uh, on moon because on moon you can get uh, 24 by 7 uh, sunlight so all that electricity that, that uh, sunlight is being converted into uh, radio frequency lasers and that lasers are uh, being uh, sent to Japan where that is converted again to electricity and that will be supplied to the various uh, things. So they, they have envisaged this project by 2030, they are going to finish it. So they are utilizing this one, even though they, they don't have power cut there in Japan, but still they are doing thinking ahead. We should also think in that direction. We also worked in that direction. We have made certain uh, uh, transparent uh, materials which can be coated on solar cells. Because if it is a powder thing, then the actual sunlight will not go and your solar cell will not work. There should be a transparent cover plate, transparent glass plate with this nanophosphor coating so that the efficiency will increase a lot. So this is what we have seen. This, the, the photoluminescent spectrum, we can see this is the uh, original spectrum. By putting such type of coated uh, screen, 
then the efficiency increased and uh, this was appreciated by nature also that we are we are doing wonderful work in that one and there are some up conversion phosphors also we are working like using lasers core shell structures core shell means uh, like uh, center there is another uh, material and uh, as a core and shell type of thing so it will absorb and it will create a visible light coming out of that one so that also we have initiated and the earlier tvs are like this now uh, future tvs are like carbon nanotube emitters will be put uh, the spacing will be in microns and uh, special phosphors uh, people are making we are also making so that this will be sealed in very thin uh, type of thing and we are going to make it flexible also so that what happens if you, uh, you, you and everything will be under vacuum this will be a foldable tvs acd tvs for future very thin maybe calendar tvs also you can uh, call it just uh, put a nail and then you can hang your tv there so these are the things uh, for which we are also working and we are making different types of phosphors and we are trying to consult the industries those who can make such type of tvs and quantum dots they are all appreciated uh, by various uh, sources and various uh, uh, universities and uh, abroad universities and uh, nanotechnology websites so all these things we are uh, carrying it out and another important application this maybe you people also can think is uh, see uh, when this note bandhi has come most of the this uh, currency has uh, disappeared okay so that is because most of the higher higher currencies uh, were uh, duplicated. So these 2000 nodes and all nodes, including our 10 rupee nodes. So they have got special phosphors that are being put on that one. Not only our Indian currency, all uh, this is the British pound, uh, this is the ruble and many other uh, currencies also. They use fluorescent inks. They just put it. They, they, they doesn't, doesn't look in the normal light, but under ultraviolet lights are certain things. And uh, Dinar, they have got a very spe uh, dots, specialized dots they have put it. So it is very difficult to duplicate that one. Okay, those things. Uh, so these, you know that even though now our Indian currency is from Indian paper and Indian uh, uh, printing after the... Uh, Modi ji has uh, announced that note bandi and they have introduced a new currency with different sizes okay so earlier to that one we were importing the the paper we were importing the fluorescent inks normal inks because this paper is a special paper you see how many times you can fold it and unfold it it won't break whereas normal uh, a4 size paper or any paper which you use in our notebook so if you multiply if you maybe 100 times you, if you fold it it will break it into pieces but these things they run for longer time so special materials so he has initiated he has told uh, many scientists to work on this paper ncl pune is working on uh, this paper uh, production they successfully did it this fluorescent materials still they are importing from uh, germany so the, the, all these uh, currencies they are using so if you can make quantum dots highly emitting quantum dots uh, and if you can supply to mint uh, indian mint so then they can print it but there are certain problems also because the, they should not be washed away with water they should not lose their uh, fluorescence uh, so sometimes uh, some currency notes are there in your pocket and your wife might have put it to your uh, belongings into washing machine so because of the caustic potash and other things the fluorescence should not die not only that sometimes uh, you iron your uh, notes okay in that case also it should not diminish so there are many other uh, harsh tests one has to do before uh, that to be used in uh, any currency note because even if you iron it uh this this uh, fluorescence will not go whereas our phosphor whatever you make it if you iron it then everything will go away so if if it can resist those uh, conditions then you will become a billionaire really you one uh, those who can make such type of any colored ink so they can supply it to the whole world okay in one or two companies one is uh, germany and one is in australia they are making and they are supplying to whole world. 
we also tried uh, one uh, fluorescent ink with red color but uh, still the test we need to do it in 2010 we did it and it was appreciated by nature also india also started working on such type of systems like that and uh, they appreciated our work but the harsh test uh, we could not uh, perform it we are uh, still working with uh, the mint compound where they print the notes but uh, still now they are still importing the inks from abroad only so this is one of the areas where you people can think and work in that direction so sunlight uh, sensitized not only ultraviolet but sunlight uh, excitable materials also we have made and we have used for various applications these are uh, uh, what do you call that phosphorescent materials okay they can use it on toys taj mahal structural damage many other ornaments uh, uh, signages like you go this way that way arrow marks and fingerprints many other applications we have uh, done and we have made many other uh, tools just to show that here is under light and under dark condition they glow like this and articles also taj mahal not exact original taj mahal but this is a monument a small piece we have taken and then we have coated and could show the different colors in that and even exit signages in uh, npl national physical laboratory we have replaced with our phosphor material if there is a light at the back if suddenly there is a power off then it, it, this will glow and it will show the path so these are the things we have been working and uh, uh, last slide we we are also working on fluorescent and magnetic uh, nanoparticles what is the idea of having both the properties is like you can have a drug molecule or a medicine and a nanoparticle with this and if the nanoparticle is coated with this drug and with a sm small magnet you can tune it to the exact tumor site okay so we have developed various uh, these materials of various colors and we have tested let me show you a small animation thing why this type of uh, fluorescent and magnetic uh, materials are very important suppose there is a solid tumor that is present near to liver or near to heart you cannot directly inject it here so you need to give an injection here so uh, for example uh, cancer uh, therapy cancer treatment they give uh, many medicines and it will go from head to uh, legs uh, and it will damage most of the kidneys and uh, sometimes the ca cancer patient you can see that uh, hair hair has been lost and their skin become pale and many other things these are the side effects of the cancer drug only 5 to 10% of drug will go to the actual tumor site to kill this one to kill the cancer cells but 90% it is damaging the whole body can we have a system like you give an injection put a magnet here so that everything comes here without damaging and you can give only 10% of injection only not necessary to give uh, that much so here you see then when the injection is given it goes to the heart and little will go to this one and it will go to the other uh, parts okay so if uh, and uh, let me show So if I put a magnetic field, highly concentrated magnetic field here, then the particles will be attracted by that magnetic field. See, now magnetic field is applied. So all the materials will be accumulated there. So, and by flipping the magnetic field here, by you, you, if you are making it uh, like uh, North Pole, South Pole, North Pole, South Pole, like you're rotating it, then the, uh, from the particles the medicine will be uh, like you take a metal piece and uh, put uh, up and down like this then after some time you see that the metal piece will be broken into two pieces like that here also the, the drug will be uh, flushed out from these particles so we have to we are working on such type of systems so that this is called target drug delivery system without disturbing without uh, causing trouble to the other organs so this type of uh, medicine delivery is given then with less dosage we can help the patient so this type of work we are working with uh, einstein college of medicine in uh, new york bronze uh, along with uh, uh, nanotheranostics uh, a small company which is there in uh, new york so we are associating with them to develop such type of thing my my thing is to develop these particles and they are biodegradable particles 
inorganic biodegradable particles and the addition addition of uh, the attaching the medicine and other things the the other people like uh, the nano theranostics is doing and the actual testing that uh, Einstein College of Medicine they are uh, checking in some mice and other other things. So uh, nano uh, 2010, we have seen some applications of this nano phosphor materials in paintings, coatings, pigments, medicines, and so on. Na nano 2020, nano phosphor 2020, we have seen some bio sensors, functional materials, and uh, drug delivery systems, and many other things. But nano 2030, we can see many materials uh, related to nano and nano phosphor related uh, sensors and electronics displays flexible displays many other things may come up in uh, next decade so this is these are the things which we can estimate it and uh, my own research emphasis is on these materials and uh, these are the products which we have already developed and these are the technologies uh, our group has transferred to various uh, companies one is for this Catline Infraprod is a private company, is a government company. Uh, this is Samtel is again private company. This is for government DRDO, for DRDO, uh, Liquid Crystal Research uh, Institute, and then ISRO. And then this is another private company. Once again, we have made one particle analyzer and supplied there. And phosphors uh, for plasma display also, we have given it to Samtel Ghaziabad. So, Depending upon the industry requirement, we work and then we try to deliver the products to them. So finally, I thank uh, the principal and director of FDP, Dr. Madhav Devahane, sir, and Dr. Abhijit Yadav, sir, who uh, requested me to deliver this talk. He's the coordinator. <laughs> Sorry, the spelling is uh, wrong here. Uh, coordinator. So coordinator of this workshop and uh, uh, all the participants who, who are uh, patiently listening my talk for two hours uh, in this FTP program on this photonics. And uh, I also thank all the teaching and non-teaching staff who are associated uh, for this program uh, from this Rajasri Shahu Maha Vidyalaya, uh, Latur, Maharashtra State. Thank you very much. And this is our institute uh, during the Independence Day celebrations. And this is my card. You can have my email and uh, phone numbers here. You can contact me at any time. And thank you very much for your patient listening. And I'm happy to answer a few questions if uh, the audience have. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, dear participants, the session is now open for discussion. I think Mayur has raised a hand. Mayur, ask your question briefly. Hello, sir. Ah, hello, Mayur. Uh, which type of laser that can be used in the photo So that's a good question. Photo basically, uh, if you use ultraviolet laser, the 325 uh, laser uh, that is available, okay, in the market, 325 laser, 325 nanometers. So usually they use uh, that type of laser and sometimes uh, uh, they use uh, uh, blue lasers also. Some of the materials, if, see always you have to see that from left to right. Uh, if you are using ultraviolet, the emission will be from visible, in the visible region from blue to red. Okay. If you are using a blue laser of 450 nanometers, then your emission will always come near red. Okay. So blue lasers also be okay. used, but mostly 325 nanometer laser, ultraviolet laser. It is also called ultraviolet laser. That's what people use. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, sir. You. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yes. Now I request uh, one of my colleague, Mr. Maruti Kumbar, sir, to propose a vote of thanks. Thank you, sir. It's an honor to have been asked to offer a vote of thanks on the occasion of faculty development program on the behalf of our college and the department of physics electronics and the photonics i am very heartily gratitude to eminent research person dr d harnath sir national institute of technology warangal for sharing lot of information we are really enlightened with your knowledge 
and the presence sir this is one of the memorable session sir you have given the information of the total luminescence spectroscopy how to generate the light artificial lightning technology fluorescence and the phosphorescence story behind the phosphorus and the phosphorescence sir then you have moved towards the that instrumentations part and the applications of the that special nano phosphorus so thank you sir for your fruitful information i extend the thanks to honorable dr abhijit adosh sir as the young scientist and head of the department of the physics electronics and the photonics and the coordinator of the fdp i also want to thanks to heads of the various departments faculty members research scholars and the students of for attending and the kind operation in making the session successful finally i would like to thank all my colleagues for the that to making the success, uh, session successful and so finally thank you all for your kind attention thank you all thank you very much sir thank you sir thank you very much okay bahut badhiya ho gaya